Hey, listen, thanks for tuning in. Uh, my friend Steve Gillen has a new show, The Steve Gillen Files. It's a new series that he's doing, and uh, new subscribers he needs on the show. We did a great interview about a month ago, and uh, I want to put it up here because I want to share it with my people. So uh, stay tuned. It's going to be a good show. And uh, get back to me. Let me know what you think about it because uh, Steve Gillen's a great guy. He's a good man, and uh, his show does very well. Very well. And uh, so this is a new uh, venture that he's in. I guess they're going uh, international with this show. He's going to be on many uh, different platforms and stations. Uh, but right now on YouTube, uh, he doesn't have many subscribers on that channel. He has many on his other channel. Very well uh, known guy over there in England, in the UK, in uh, Europe. Uh, so stay tuned. This is going to be a good show. And uh, I, ho I hope you like it. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back to the Stephen Gillen Crime Files. Today we're going to go back into the darkness. It's going to be raw. We're going to go into the area again of mafia, of organized crime. We're going to talk to a, a, a ex-mafia capper, a captain who was in charge of a crew, who was uh, indicted for many murders, uh, suspected of many murders, grew up in the mafia and his father, his brother, and his cousin were assassinated in a very infamous mob killing in Boston back years ago. Imagine that, guys. We're going to go behind the curtain and meet this guy and find out about his amazing journey. My guest today is ex-mafia capo Bobby Luizzi. Bobby, thanks for coming on the platform. Oh, thank you for having me on, Stephen. Now, Bobby, you have a, a very unique story. Your father, your brother, your cousin were assassinated in together at a restaurant in Boston many years ago. We're going to get to that. And you as a main man, an actual senior member of the Cosa Nostra, you was a captain. We're going to get to that too. It's an unbelievable story, Bobby. But first, I want to go back to where it started. I want to go back to where you grew up in Boston. And I want to find out a bit about the environment that, that drove you towards this life. So what was it like growing up, Bobby? Well, I grew up in uh, Boston, a little Italy in the north then. Uh, that was headquarters for La Cosa Nostra. So every block that you walk down in the neighborhood, there were wise guys, associates. Um, the North End was very famous for that. And uh, I grew up around all these people. My father in his younger days uh, hooked up with these uh, people. He was an associate for a long time and a opposed member of the family. And uh, my father was a bad guy. He was a big guy. He was a tough guy. He was a bad guy also. And uh, very well respected in the neighborhoods and by the family there, the Patriarca family. At a young age, I started working for them. I worked in their uh, vending company uh, for a few years. Uh, at 11, 12, 13 years old, uh, I was with them in uh, Rome vending. And during that time, even as a young guy, we'd hit all the social clubs, meet all the wise guys. And it was just a norm in my life. You know, and it was just always around me. Uh, my mother and father got divorced at a young age. Uh, she moved to East Boston and she met my uh, father, Santo. They got married. Now, my father, Santo, was in the life too. A bookmaker, loan shark, social clubs. So it was just always around me. It drives to me. There was no way to get away from it, Stephen. This was my life growing up. And I thought it was normal. I thought it was normal growing so up. I'm getting that. So your father, you know, he was a very um, influential, very known organized crime figure. I'm interested in his background 
a little bit, Bobby. Did they come over from Italy? Or, you know, how did it work? What was his upbringing like towards driving him towards this life? Well, I got to tell you, now, my uh, grandpa, Luisi, was born here, but the grandma, Mother Razza, was born in Italy, and she came over. So he was actually first, second generation. And um, my grandfather was a hard worker. He was a capita, and he tried to get all his sons into that. My father himself had different ideas in life. Now, my father grew up in the neighborhood, tough guy. Uh, he was a weightlifter. Uh, I don't know if you remember those 60 movies. Uh, he was at the all that and uh, in the gym every day. And, you know, he became a feared guy in the neighborhood at a young age. And uh, the wise guys in the neighborhood noticed that and they pulled him right in. So he was going to force the father. He ran uh, some of their nightclubs, after hour club script joints. My father was in it in every facet. And uh, when I was coming up, a young kid, I was his son, Bobby Luisi's son. So I was well respected on myself, even as a young kid. And it was easy for me to walk into that life because my father already stepped in it. So, uh, you know, your father was a strong guy. Well, he was a yeah. killer. Was he a killer? Was he nice he, to you? He was, a killer. he was a killer. Yeah. He was a killer. Did he have a, did he have a hair trigger? You know, was it a hair trigger uh, temper? Was you walking on eggshells around him? Did he have a softer side? Was he measured? Well, growing up with my father, uh, it, it all depended with him. He was a sharp guy like that. You know, he knew who to go after, what to do. Uh, he treated everybody a little differently. Uh, he, he could right off, right off the, the, the dime go at somebody, you know, if he, if he uh, wanted to. Uh, overall, a lot of people loved him in the neighborhood. He tried to help everybody in the neighborhood. You know, but another bad guy, he would go after in a minute. He wouldn't care. I mean, uh, I know he murdered. I know that. Uh, we know that in the neighborhood. And he was just an all-around guy. Uh, very feared and well-respected. Now, there's going to be some photos, you know, here. I mean, Boston in them days was very tough, you know. It was tough, you know, to make an ends meet. Did he have a softer side? In the family, did you ever see a softer side, a gentler side to your father? Yeah, I'd seen that. We used to have a lot of fun. Uh, me and my cousins, my brothers with my father, you know. But uh, uh, a lot of time, that gangster will come out of him. You know, he wasn't a guy to uh, play with too much. You know, he always kept us on an even kill. And kind of like we were underneath him, he was the patriarch of the whole family. So we all listened to him. And when he gave us an order, we took it. Um, we never took nothing for granted with him. He could be very stern at times, but he could be loving at times too. I have to say that about him. So it was regimented, I'm guessing, in the old Italian, old school way. Yeah. Was he family oriented? Was he good to your mother, Bobby? They got divorced at a very young age. They married very young, you know. But uh, yeah, when they were together, he was good to my mother. But like I said, they got married out of high school. My mother was 18 years old. And, you know, that was the tradition in the neighborhood at the time. Her and her girlfriends graduated. They all got married. But it just didn't work out. You know, my father liked the life. You know, he was out on the street. My father was uh, wild on the street. And there was other things going on. And I'm sure I took after him many other women in Gumas. You know, so uh, my mother was a different type of person and more settled down and more business minded than my father was legally i should say you know so it just didn't work out father we're painting a picture here you know and for you know a vast audience out there i know one of the questions some of them will be saying okay so this guy is a killer a notorious killer who you know ends up finding his own death through the life that he chose so how is it possible to live that life, be a killer, but be gentle as well and loving? What would you say to that, Bobby? Well, I know going through it myself, I, I felt that, uh, we're saying using an example, you know, I follow my father's uh, footsteps. We all know that. And um, when we get into life, we're not all... Uh, 
we don't get in the life most of us to be a killer. You know, that comes with the territory. When you want to be a part of life in that life, that's part of it. You know, I, I never signed up for La Cosa Nostra to be a killer. Although I was violent before I joined La Cosa Nostra. But I'll tell you this, uh, we're all, a lot of us, just regular family guys. And we try to live our life like that. We always try to separate the street from our home and our family. And that's what a good, wise guy does. So yeah. It's like a duality. I can't explain it. You got to be on the street, but you got to be loving in your house. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting that. And we're going to go a little bit more into the dynamics of this because I know that this was one fascinating part to viewers really understanding how these things can coexist. So, um, you join the mafia. We're going to get further onto that. We've got an idea of your lineage now, Bob, and why you was this was all you knew, as it was. You, you know, you grew up amongst this. Mm -hmm. It's very common. Um, so, when you join the mafia, you know, and you as a senior member, you went on to be a senior member. They'll ask you that that comes before your own family. Would you kill for the mafia, or was you was you prepared to kill for the mafia? Oh, absolutely. That's what we did. Actually, uh, in, in the 90s, we had a war up here in Boston. A lot of guys got killed, you know, and uh, we all did our fair share. Thank God we made it out of there. But, uh, yeah, I would kill at the behest of my bosses if I had to. Whatever they wanted me to do, I would do. And I know you were suspected of many murders. We're going to get to that further on. But I'm just going to ask this straight question because that's the best way too. So, you know, and, you know, then we want to see what the drivers are and why you would make them choices, uh, Bob. So did you always look up to your father and what was his instruction about the life? Did he tell you to stay away from it or was it attractive? And he said, this is what we do. What was his uh, early instruction to you? Well, you have to understand, when I was around my father in my teenage years, uh, I was around the wise guys with him. Like I said, it was a norm. I don't think my father was trying to bring me into life. It's just that these are the people that he were he was around. He was around, my uncles were around, and you know, these are just guys that we grew up. These were made guys, captains. These are guys that we grew up with, and it was just a normal way of life. And uh, that wasn't my first choice to be a gangster. Uh, you know, I was in, uh, I had a development company for a little while. I was a builder. But uh, when things went bad, I went right back on the street because that's what I knew to do. When I came back on the streets, my father was a little hesitant with me. He really didn't want me to get into the life that deep. You know, but I was with a crew of bad guys. Uh, some of us were getting killed. We killed some of them, our enemies at that time. We were fighting against three different factions in Boston, and uh, we made it true, God bless. But uh, my father wasn't crazy about it, to be honest with you. That I so, you know, this is a patriarchal family, right? You know, we're going back to the war. Yeah, you know, there was a 1980s to 90s war. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here, right? So um, where did it start for you? Where did the violence start for you? And what was the line where you made the choice that I'm gonna commit myself to this life? Well, the violence started for me in my 20s. Uh, I'm not gonna to go too deep into that, but I think you can imagine. Uh, I did some pretty bad things. And uh, like I said, I really didn't get back in on the streets till I was 30 years old. And when I was 30 years old, I hit the streets hard and there was a war up in Boston. And then there was a murder in 1993 uh, one of my friends got killed, and that escalated the war even more. And, you know, I was right in the middle of it. Now we're on the street, we're in the money. In that life, you believe, see, we believe we're soldiers in that life. We're in that life. It's just like a soldier going into battle. We believe in our thing. This is our way. These are people that are trying to take things away from us. So our first course of action is to either kill them or beat them back. And that's what we did. So it was kind of normal for me. It wasn't uh, maybe like a civilian had to pick up a gun and kill somebody. It was just a way, you know, a way of life. 
you get a callus over your heart, I guess, and uh, you just go out and do what you have to do. So you enjoyed the violence, Bobby? Did I enjoy it? Yeah, did you enjoy it? Were there times that you enjoyed the violence, living like that? Uh, well, I, I have to be honest with you. It was like a high for me. You know, one of my guys said to me one day, we were on a walk and talk, and he said, Bobby, if you don't have chaos in your life every day, you're not happy. But that's how he analyzed it. And he was right. I love being in the midst of that. I love making the money. I love ducking from the law. Yeah, it was exciting to me. It gave me a high. Maybe to some people, it's like jumping out of an airplane. It's sad people got killed now. You know, I have different beliefs. But I talk about it now because I'm not that guy anymore, you know. But, uh, yeah, I was pretty uh, pretty deep into it, Stephen. Now, there's a lot of trauma and fallout from these actions. You know that more than anyone, Bob, bro. Yes. We're, gonna, we're gonna revisit some of them times now because this is about choices and it is about outcomes to our choices. Mm -hmm. so, now, your father, you loved your father, right? I was close to my father to a point. Okay. Now, take us back to the day. Now, this was a infamous assassination. That's what it was, um, you know. Very unfortunate, but this is the life that Mafia members choose, Bob. You know that. You know, oh, yeah. they, 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 there's, there's no way out of it. You know that. So when your father died, your father died, your uh, brother Roman died, and yes. your first cousin died um, in uh, the 99 restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, now take us back to that time and tell us what happened and your feelings of what happened on that day and the fallout from that. Well, uh, I don't like to discuss that too much, but I'm going to discuss it today. And I'll tell you the story and what built up to that. Uh, two guys that were with me in the North End. See, my father had his own crew, and I had my own crew. And my my father, myself, and my father, we didn't, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. So one of his guys said something off cuff to one of my guys, and uh, they end up giving him a beating. They hurt him really bad in a coffee shop in the North End. Now, my brother Roman was a killer, straight stone cold killer. And uh, after my guys did that, they came to me, told me what happened. When my brother Roma found out, now he's looking for my guys, you know. So at that point, my father had called me the night before that, that happened. And he says, uh, are you with me referring that I'm going to take his side against my own guys, you know. And I said that I'll never be with you. And we had words on the phone and we hung out the phone. And then the next day, they bumped into each other in the 99, and my family got killed. That's the truth of the story. How did it affect me? Emotionally, it didn't. And I'll be honest with you, Stephen. It's sad about my brother but and my cousin, but things happen. This is the life. So, And let's uh, unpick that a little bit because it's fascinating. You know, I have to say, and I know that another question that people say is, how could you compartmentalize something like that for your own blood? You know, where, you know, you are the same genes. You've gone through all that life together, but it's like in the mafia, your friends are the ones who come to kill you. So right. try and explain for the viewers that how that actually works inside you something like that Bobby well you know, I guess, like you know my heart was hardened Stephen with a lot of different things you know um obviously I you know I came from a broken home my mother and father got divorced at a young age uh at a young age I started taking care of myself I was very uh, self-centered egotistical prideful and I think that blocked a lot of things uh as far as my father I was never really that close with him, you know, with that father-son bond. There was always little problems between him and I. Uh, so, you know, when that day happened, 
I just took it like another murder. Someone else in the crew got murdered, and I left it like that. You know, I, I wasn't a good person, Steve. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll admit that at that time. So you felt nothing? I really no. Actually, it was a little relief because, uh, thank God, I didn't have to go up against my father myself. You see, now this is a, a real paradox of the life. And people who wouldn't have any understanding of a life like that would not come to terms with that or grips to that or understand how that kind of thinking would be possible. But it's classic mafia thinking, Bob, right? If you don't, but, yes. If you don't think like that, Stephen, you're not going to make it. So make it. what is it then? You know, so we're talking like the greed and the status and the power and the influence superimposes everything even family is this what you're saying well that's what the mafia is built on that's what the cause of Austria is built on that was my family don't get me wrong no one was ever going to hurt my wife my children my mother my sisters that was never going to happen my brother roman was a killer himself it's not my brother was innocent the only innocent one my my cousin anthony that was terrible that that happened to him and them that's sad. But the rest of them, no. It was not failing for them. Did you go to the funeral, Bobby, and pay your respects? Yeah, I had to stay at my father's funeral. You know, at that point, a lot of his guys were coming in, and the family, my uncles, were directing them to me, telling them that, you know, I was taking everything over at that point. So it was more like business for me when I went to the funeral. So I'm guessing as the son of the father, you have to step up again. So yeah. what, you know, and this is about procuring territory, right? And rackets and even people, yeah. Um, money, yeah. Positioning for more power. So how did that work in that vacuum? Well, you know, after that happened with my father, you know, the Louis C family still had a uh, show strength. So we went right back out on the street. And I started putting everything back together, grabbing his people, let them know we were there. It's business. It's business, you know? And uh, it's like a company. You don't want to let them know you're going bankrupt, right? So what, you, what do you do? You got to push out there. You got to talk to your customers. You got to get your people. It's the same thing. I went out the next day and I started putting everything back together. And I took my father's stuff and I put it in one our crew. And what did that feel like to do that, knowing your father had passed and you had to keep going? Was you so locked in the life and the darkness that nothing infiltrated that progression? Or was there moments of my father's past? Stephen, it was his business. If you can relate to that, it was just business to me. I've lost other friends in the war and had to go pick up after them. It was the same thing. I can understand what it would be to live a life like that. So now you become a carpon, which is a captain. It's a very, you know, it's a senior, a senior guy in charge of, you know, it would be kind of, kind of like a CEO of a division right yes. of, yes. A, of a of a of a borough or a, an area you know a vast area but you just don't arrive at these places uh, bob you have to make your way up so how did this progression happen for you well going through the war you know a lot of guys got killed enemies got killed friends got killed and as the war was uh, progressing i kept building my my little empire my crews you know, I had a lot of uh, Irish guys that were with me, great guys. And, uh, you know, during the course of the years going on, I just kept getting bigger and bigger, spreading out, working with more people. I had crews in uh, Connecticut all the way up to Maine. You know, we were making money. And uh, I just kept building as this was going on. A lot of guys were hiding and I was building. So at that point, when my father got killed, I was just ready to go into another position, to another level, when I took his stuff over. 
And at that point, after he got killed, um, I was a proposed man in the Patriarca family at that time. And I had a problem with one of the captains. Uh, it, it almost got really out of hand. And at that point, I knew I was never going to get made in the Patriarca family. So I reached out to New York and Philadelphia. And I uh, ended up meeting Joey Molino, and I became a couple with his family. Now, what that did for me, that was a little unique what I did. Because now, coming back to Boston, I'm a boss in Boston. Now, there was a lot of really um, main, iconic, historic, organized crime figures of the day. People like Whitey Bulger, you know, yeah. uh, the Irish crews over there. Now, I know there was a lot of the names. There's going to be some, you know, some other photographs and some other things that the uh, audience are going to see here, some other content to give them a look into into the neighborhood and uh, yes. uh, some of the iconic characters that they may not know who we are talking about. You knew Whitey Bulger. I never had any uh, dealings with Whitey. I know who he was. Uh, you know, Whitey mostly stood in South Boston. He really didn't come around us. Um, you know, Iris was, was all, you know, all the main guys and the soldiers. You know, he couldn't be that. You know, uh, he, had a, he had a good crew in South Boston. I mean, they were very dangerous crew. And uh, Whitey was a very dangerous guy, and I won't take that away from him. But as far as us being like an Ostra, he wasn't in our category or equal to us. They make a big deal of Whitey because Whitey had uh, worked with Connolly, the FBI agent. And when Whitey went on the run, that made him, uh, you know, the number one Probably guy. Number one, yeah. It's interesting about Boston, about how the Irish, the Irish mafia, the kind of uh, coexistence you guys had there. That's why I put that example there. So you went to you went to New York and um, uh, the Gambino crime family. So yes. what happened with that? What was the the process there? Well, I had a very close friend in Rhode Island, Jerry Cormet, and Jerry's doing life right now, and he was very well known, the Frenchman. Uh, they, he could be looked up, and uh, he had allies in the Gambino family. So he told me, Bobby, I'm going to send my friend Gigi up there, and, uh, you know, we want to hook you up with the Gambino family. So Gigi went back to Pete Gaudi, and he had a meeting with him. And uh, Pete told him, listen, tell Bobby, you know, there's already a family up there. Because of commission rules, I can't get involved. I don't want to get involved with that. And I understood that, and I understood where Pete was coming from. So from there, we ended up going to Philadelphia. Now, you got to remember, in Philly, they had the same war down there. And Joey came out on top. And, uh, you know, Joey and I had a lot of common. And we hit it off real good with Georgie and all the guys down there. I really liked and respected those men down there. And uh, we hooked up, and I became a couple with the family. So this, you know, at this time in New York, um, this was the time, it was a very iconic time there as well with with the five New York the Costa Nostra families this was yeah. the you know the era of John Gotti and you know there's some you know there's some stuff here we're going to see and um Sammy the Bro Gramano and of course in many ways I highlight this because this was the beginning of the end of the you know the five uh fam five New York families yes so you come back to back to Boston. So when was it that you met Ralph Natale? Well, I met Ralph first. After uh, I got that message back from um, Pete Gaudi, a friend of mine, Frank Ross, he passed away now. Uh, he was a good guy in my crew, did some work for me. Uh, Frank passed away now, but uh, he took me down. He did time with, with uh, Ralph Natale. He told me a lot about Ralph. He said, why don't you go down and talk to Ralph? So I took a ride down to Cherry Hill one day in New Jersey, and I uh, sat with Ralph. And I liked Ralph at the time, you know. From there, I met George Borghese. And from George, I ended up meeting Joey and the rest of the crew. So that's how I met Ralph Natale. So for the viewers out there, you know, we're going to come in now to, in part two, we're going to, Go deeper.
we're going to go raw. We're going to see what the ceremony to actually become a main member of the mafia was at that time. And we're going to see how your uh, story escalates, uh, Bobby. And that's going to be in part two.